My name is Terry Winnick, a member of the Edmonton Jewish Film Festival Committee, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's talk. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of the many donors and sponsors who have made this film festival possible. We're very grateful for their support. You'll find a list of all of their names in our virtual festival. I extend special thanks to the Persian Lessons sponsor, the Holocaust Education Committee of the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. The Edmonton Jewish Film Festival wishes to respectfully acknowledge that our festival is held on Treaty 6 territory, a gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose history, languages, cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. A few other quick notes. Your sound is muted, so please keep it off if you don't want to disturb the speakers. We're recording the session. Remember, you may be on camera. Our speaker will speak for about 35 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A. You can put questions in the chat, directing them to our moderator, Sam Koplowitz, at any time, and we'll address them at the end. We are delighted today to welcome our special guest, Vadim Perlman, Director of Persian Lessons. Mr. Perlman's early career was as a commercial filmmaker, shooting large-scale commercials for an impressive list of clients, including Microsoft, General Motors, AT&T, Nike, and Sony PlayStation. In 2004, he won great acclaim for writing, directing, and producing his first feature film, The House of Sand and Fog, three-time Oscar-nominated film. He went on to create acclaimed films, The Life Before Her Eyes, Atlas Shrugged, The Giver, and The Talisman. In television, Perlman's projects include Ice, a dramatic series about the global diamond industry, as well as some huge hits for Russian television. Persian Lessons, starring Lise Eidinger and Nahuel Perez Biscayart, premiered at the Berlin International Film Festival in 2020 to standing ovations, has garnered numerous awards and been released in over 50 countries worldwide. You'll be curious to learn that this most prestigious and world-renowned filmmaker is no stranger to Edmonton. A Ukrainian-born Jew, he fled the Soviet Union in the 1980s and came to Canada. Living for several years in Edmonton, he played ping pong at the Jewish Community Center and attended the U of A. So it is my great pleasure to welcome back Vadim to Edmonton. Moderating today's discussion is Film Festival Chair Sam Koplovitz. Sam retired in 2007 after a career of more than 50 years in film, audiovisual, and multimedia production, and returned to Edmonton to live the life of a gentleman of leisure and to look after his elderly mum of blessed memory. He's worked for the Alberta government, the city of Edmonton, the province of British Columbia, and for 20 years in the academic technology department at San Jose State University. He's been involved with the Edmonton Jewish Film Festival since 2008 and is currently the president of the Edmonton Jewish Senior Center. Thanks, Sam, for moderating today and for all you do for our community. Sam. Oh, uh, well, I thought you were going to just uh, give the hand it over to uh, <laughs> Nadine to speak. Uh, I, I don't have any prepared remarks. So thank you for that introduction. Um, and uh, I think really without any further ado, um, I, I'm, I assume people are still coming in. That's really great. Uh, it's, we're having a very good turnout for this talk. It's very uh, gratifying. Um, so uh, as I say, without any further uh, ado, uh, let's just give the floor to Vadim. Uh, please um, tell, us, uh, tell us about this film. Uh, I'm particularly interested in um, your experiences. I, I think it was shot in Belarus, if I'm correct. And if you, so please just Absolutely you and tell, tell us about it. Hi everybody! Hello Edmonton. It's uh, incredible to be to be back uh, in a way. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm in Vancouver, so not too far away, and where I live now. Uh, uh, 
I, uh, the film was made, as Sam said, the film was made in, uh, in uh, Babrusk. Then even in Russia at that time. Uh, and uh, we made sure to, um, to keep it very uh, authentic in many ways. You know, it was uh, the the model for the camp. I assume all of you have seen the films. I'm not gonna I'm gonna not gonna worry about spoilers or anything like that. Um, uh, the model for the camp was uh, uh, Stutthof Natzweiler, uh, which was in uh, eastern France, uh, northeastern France, Alsace uh, area, and uh, it was a transit camp not to be confused with, uh, with uh, death camps, uh, internment camps and death camps that were uh, existing at that time. Um, the, the only thing, the only liberty I took was uh, the, say, the, the inscription above the gates, which was uh, to each his own. That was from Buchenwald, I believe. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, we, we stayed fairly accurate. Uh, I wanted I wanted to make sure uh, this was a big battle. Which language do we film it in? Because the script was written in Russian by a Russian uh, screenwriter, and I translated it to English. Uh, and uh, then at that point, it was like, where where do we go from here? Because I don't know any German. You know, I, I directed the film in German, and I have no idea, nor French. For that matter, so so for me, for me, it was uh, it was a, a real challenge to direct it in another language. Um, it's you know it, it was a real decision of, of what language to use because there's the, the big the big trade off between uh, uh, the film being more acceptable and popular in North America uh, or uh, more authentic all over the world, really. And so uh, we made the right choice, I, I believe, you know, because, uh, you know, I've never liked even even films like Schindler's List. I've never I've never liked uh, when Germans spoke English with a German accent, you know, it's uh, in, in films, just a little too Hogan's heroes for my taste. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I really it, it made it made it very challenging, very difficult. The whole the whole thing was kind of like a Babel's Tower of uh, of uh, languages. Uh, I mean, the, the main premise is a, is an invented language, which I'll talk about how we invented it and so on. Uh, and then the the second uh, part of it was the whole uh, lost in translation um, aspect of translating from one language to another, and then to yet a third language, the German. Uh, which had to happen. Uh, all the all the dialogue in the scenes was translated the night before by someone in Berlin, where I would send him the final. I would write the final moments and send it off to Berlin, and that person, not just a translator, because we have plenty of translators. Uh, uh, this was a a creative translator that could you know uh, make the dialogue on the same level as it was written in English. And so, so uh, that came back to the actors that night, uh, like late at night. They studied the lines late at night, and then they had to go and do this in, in German. Another language related, uh, you know, <laughs> hurdle was that uh, Noel, who played uh, Reza, who played Gilles, uh, didn't speak German at all. And he ended up speaking the whole film, he ended up speaking German. Uh, he spoke phonetically. And so the nights, uh, they, they actually lived together in the same, same hotel. The nights, Lars, who played the Nazi officer, would teach uh, G, uh, Noel, excuse me, would teach Noel how to say German, how to pronounce German words with the right inflection. And then on the screen, Noel would teach Lars how to speak fake Farsi. So, so it was, you know, it was a kind of a crazy, crazy thing like that. But you know, my our German uh, speaking uh, viewers and audiences, they say it's flawless. 
You know, he even he even has a bit of a French French accent, which you would expect from a Belgian, and uh, and uh, he you know so that turned out well. Um, it was a real challenging, really really challenging, really emotional um, uh, production because uh, Bobruisk was a major Jewish center. It really was. There was there was even a ghetto. Uh, in Babrusk, uh, where we shot the film. It's a horrible town. It's, uh, you know, everything, everything's still kind of Soviet there uh, in the middle of Belarus. And uh, just, you know, there was one, one place we could eat, one, one restaurant, literally, which was quite nice, actually. We, we thank them in the credits. Uh, and uh, the place we shot, the place, the camp, was uh, kind of a pie, you know, like a, the letter, the Greek letter pie, uh, shaped large building, which alternatively was during during history was a Gestapo headquarters, an NKVD prison, an army prison, Soviet army prison. I mean, it had these incredible, uh, incredible like vibe, uh, you know, and soul all the way through it. It was cold. It was damp and cold inside that building, way colder than it was outside. We used to go outside to warm up. Uh, it was this constant barking of these damn black German shepherds, which uh, for all Jewish people, I think you get that uh, genetic response in the back of your neck when, when you see these dogs and when you when you actually, because it's, it's somehow, the, you know, we remember them, even though we weren't there. Uh, and um, and it was very, very like. And but I think it helped. I really do. I think it helped the film. It was. It wasn't easy to film. You know, we just waited for it to be over. Uh, there was never. You know, some people. It's interesting. Some interviews they ask. Oh, tell us some fun. You know, uh, moments from the shoot and what. You know, was, was there anything that. Uh, the you know moments that you remember that were fun and there's not a single one that I can remember that was fun. It was very much a lot of work and a lot of uh, tough work. Um, the film was incredibly successful, uh, still is. Uh, I have a full room of awards here for it, statuettes from all over the world, um, not just Jewish festivals, but like. Spain, Poland, Berlin, you know, all, all kinds of, um, Italy, played in China on 23,000 screens, which was incredible for, um, yeah, really good for profits and uh, very, you know, very good for, it was nominated for a Chinese Oscar um, for a foreign film, one of five films in the world. So this is non-Chinese film, best non-Chinese film, basically, is what it was in, in, of that year. Didn't win. Very close, though. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's, been, it's had a good run, and, and I'm very happy to have made it. And um, no, that's pretty much my monologue, my unprepared monologue. So I, you know, I can answer any questions that you guys have. Well, I, I'd like to uh, uh, ask you, what, uh, how did you discover the story? What drew you to it in the first place? Uh, the story was given to me by a producer in Russia, Timur Bekmanbetov, who, um, you know, who gave me a bunch of his uh, projects and said, let's, let's think about working together. I'd love to, you know, kind of combine our talents, me as a producer, you know, uh, and uh, you as a director, Vadim, and, and uh, I, I saw this one uh, among the scripts that, that he gave me, and I loved it. Apparently, it's had a, quite a history. Uh, a couple of directors were attached to do it. Um, thankfully, they didn't get to do it. And uh, uh, it is based on a short story, loosely based on a short story that was uh, published in 1952 in East Germany. And uh, back then it was East Germany uh, by a man uh, called uh, Wolfgang Kohlhauser, uh, who wrote this story called Invention of a Language. 
which had a, a Jew in a concentration camp uh, invent, invented a language in order to survive and taught this language to a couple at that time. It was a couple who wasn't an officer. And pretty much that's it. It didn't, it didn't have, boo. It, it didn't have uh, the names angle. That's the, the one thing that it didn't, uh, it didn't, you know, which I think is what makes this film special, really. It's, uh, it's the fact that, that we came up with the idea of having uh, the words, the Farsi words be based on uh, Jewish names. Um, and that's it. And so, so the only reason, uh, the only thing we took from there, the only thing I took from that story was uh, the the main premise of teaching the language, inventing the language, and uh, and the word honor dom, which meant restaurant. I just liked the way that sounded. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Uh, every, all the other words were invented. Um, and not just words. It's a whole language that's invented. It's it's a it's a it's a valid uh, viable language that uh, a linguist professor from MGU, which is uh, Moscow State University, uh, invented this language for our, by our specifications, which were here's the words you need to make. Here are the names. And this is an important point: uh, is that I gave him a list, a real list of real Holocaust victim names. They're, they're actual names. Uh, I got them from, you know, Yad Vashem archives or wherever. And uh, I gave them those names and they're real. They're, they're not made up, of course. And we wanted a language. We want a language that's, that's uh, you know, that's uh, uh, Eastern sounding, you know, Indo, Indo-Asian. And that it that uh, is grammatically correct. It's not just a bunch of words. It's not just a vocabulary. It's it's uh, has the suffixes, the prefixes, and has the uh, the right. I'm not enough of a linguist to to know even the terms, but it has it has all the right tools to be a language. Uh, all the right elements, and he did it, and it's pretty cool. I, I still have a dictionary somewhere. It's about six hundred words. I have, a, I have a file, an Excel file. Yeah, you're a little bit like Tolkien here. You know, you're you're in very exalted company. Heck, yeah, in, inventing yeah. a language. Yeah. Um, well, the Polish a... guy that invented Esperanto. Too. Yeah, um, my 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 father was a fan of Esperanto. He 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 actually spoke it when he was and he was very dis. He said he was very disappointed that it didn't become the world language everyone was expecting. Yeah, it's it's kind of sad. Yeah, I think it would have been a better world. Um, <laughs> There's a graphic at the very beginning that says based on a true story. So, so it really was inspired, inspired, inspired by true events. Oh, okay. If any of you is a lawyer, they'll know the importance <laughs> of that. All right. All right. <laughs> yeah. We, we forgive you. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Uh, no, the reason, uh, Sam, you know, I, yeah. I'm joking, but I, I did do a search, you know, so fascinated by it, obviously. Uh, I really, uh, thorough search of the internet and uh, there is no, nothing in history that that uh, but the reason it is inspired is you know uh, because even crazier things have happened during that yeah. time even crazier survival stories even even more yeah. incredible survivor stories so you know so so that's why I said inspired by true events and not inspired by the holocaust which was a true event definitely yeah you know, well, every year when we are um, beginning to plan the festival, we get comments and a lot of people say, uh, you know, no more Holocaust films, we're tired yeah. of them, we're filled up with them, you know, enough already. But we find that you really can't escape the Holocaust in, in Jewish history. And what we look for is films that have something unique where the, yeah. the, uh, the elements of the story or there's something about it that we have not seen before. Uh, something that um, you know gives us a, a a new perspective, and I, I guess we have to say that everyone who watched this film saw this as something that was very unique, very believable. Not we all agree, very possible that this could have happened. It's it's a bizarre yeah. and and unique uh, story in itself. But yes, we're all aware. I, I mean, my parents both survived the Holocaust, and 
individually, their stories are remarkable. Every mm -hmm. single story of every survivor is something that, you know, it's hard to believe. It, it's, it's pe people say, well, you know, did you survive because you took chances or because you didn't take chances? And really, it it didn't matter. Um, I, I read a book many years ago. I think it was called Survivor. It's quite a famous book. I don't remember the name of the author. And basically, he brings out this, that, that it didn't matter, uh, you know, that it, you could decide that you were never going to step forward and, and, and take a risk, or that you would, in fact, do the opposite and take every risk possible because, you know, it, there might be a chance to survive. It didn't matter which route people took. Some survived. Most didn't. And um, so I, I think that the, in that way, this story kind of um, brings out something that is very human. And, and, and the sad and thing, the sad thing, Sam, thank you. The, the sad thing is that most of the ones that have survived, uh, they don't like to talk about it. They, they have they have this incredible guilt, which is, um, you know, completely unwarranted, of course. You know, because I think survival is, uh, you know, well, today, Today is a great example. The, the, the warriors from Mariupol, the ones that were under that uh, factory, they, they uh, gave up, you know, because their government just said, save yourselves. That's it. It's enough. You know, heroism over there, you've done it. And they came out, you know. They were going to feel guilty about that, I'm sure. But, you know, at some point, uh, human life is, is much more important than, than uh, any kind of statement or heroism or anything like that i'm going to refer to a little bit of my own personal history because it is this whole thing is very personal for me uh, my father uh, never spoke about it because what he told me was eventually is that he didn't want his children to carry the burden now we got yeah. it anyway we have, there, there's a, a a term that's referred to um, about art spiegelman you know when he wrote the famous yeah yeah mouse, mouse. Mm -hmm. and and i recently saw a seminar about that and it's it's called post memory now post memory is memories that children have that they have no direct experience of but they they remember their parents memories and we yeah. know that trauma can go from generation to generation. That's why it's such a tragedy in the world when we see refugees of all kinds. But th this is uh, something that really relates to the Holocaust. And, and I have, I'm currently writing a, 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 a whole uh, article for our, our, our local archives um, organization um, a, a, about the fact that I was born in Bergen-Belsen. It's not my story. It's my parents' story, how my father came to be in Bergen-Belsen, he was liberated there, and how my mother joined him after she was liberated in her concentration camp in, in Czechoslovakia. But how do is it that I know this story? Well, I started picking up when I was two or three years old, whatever I could glean over the years. Now, my mother would talk about it, but my father zipped mouth. He just never would ever share. And when I finally confronted him, he said he did not want to burden his children with any direct knowledge. So for me, it was little crumbs that I picked up over my whole life and I've never forgotten any of those details. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to <laughs> take this over, but, but, I, but the, a film like this really does bring out, uh, I think in many of us, and, and I hope in the people that have no direct experience with it, at least an understanding of uh, the power of these events and how we are now, what, in the third generation, and we might be in the fourth generation by now. Um, and, and, and people do not forget. And that is why whenever you hear somebody say, uh, all right, it's enough Holocaust films already, you just say, no, it's not enough. <laughs> there, there must be more and more and more and more. Good ones. <laughs> good ones. And, and, I, yeah, good ones. And so, so, so um, it's important. It's important to keep saying it's important to keep teaching, you know, people that. Uh, I see that we don't have any questions yet. Uh, um, so I'm just uh, putting a request out there to everyone. Uh, you can uh, either put them on the general um, uh, Q&A uh, chat thing or direct them to me and, uh, and then I will ask them of Vadim. Uh, we, could, we could use some help. Sure. And... I know Karen Farkas has a question for you. I'm going to ask her to unmute herself and ask it directly. Go ahead, Karen. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't find how to send it to you, okay. Sam. So uh, so I understand that he got that book by happenstance, but he presented the book 
uh, as having been given to him from his father because yeah. Bawa and the his name were on yeah. the cover page. Mm -hmm. But he also claimed that he could neither read nor write Farsi. Mm -hmm. So how how is that reconciled and how did how is that reconciled with the fact that he then ended up writing a lot of the words for uh for the commandant well he wrote them phonetically he wrote them in german okay 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 i'll start okay. from the back and then how is that how's the book reconciled you know, it's uh, you can you can get a book as a gift without knowing how to read uh, the language. You know, I've, I've got those before. Okay. But technically, so it's so, so the common technically with, for the lawyers in the audience again. <laughs> uh, te technically, I think I'm fine. <laughs> I'm not. Oh one. no, I thought it, <laughs> there, I, no, I didn't there even, are there are mistakes. I'm telling you, but but not that. I one. didn't notice. Mm -hmm. I didn't notice that until the the second watching. And then yeah. I thought, hmm, I wonder. Okay. But well, thank, thank I love it twice, the film. Yeah. Oh, it, thank it's you. wonderful. I would watch it again. Thank yeah. you. Well, and just, I, you know, to answer Sam's thing, it's another thing that brought to mind. Uh, Holocaust films, you know, uh, is a genre. It's, it's, it's really become a genre lately. And uh, they run the gamut. There's, there's like the, the full range of Holocaust films. On one end is the lighter, you know, kind of Jojo Rabbit, Life is Beautiful, you know, which were all kind of, oh, let's, let's make, uh, let's, let's present it in a different way. You know, I guess maybe I'll be kind to them. Uh, and uh, on the other end is the, is the very hardcore uh, Son of Saul, uh, Shoah, which is a documentary. You know things things that are really like let's this is what happened this this look 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 kind of films this is what this is how it went down and um so i tried to be somewhere in the middle you know and that that's uh, that's where schindler's list actually is over there with son of saul as much as it tries to be a hollywood film uh i tried to make it light and i think the most important thing what i tried to do and this is something, this was the riskiest thing, and this was what worried me the most. Uh, because at one point I would have to do this to explain myself in front of Jewish people, in front of my people. You know, why did I do this? Uh, is the humanization of the Nazis, you know, which I think was, was a, a risk that I think nobody takes. It's one of the interesting things. That, that nobody has ever taken it. You've never seen a film where the Nazis, or read a book for that matter, there's a few, there is a few, I sh shouldn't say ever or never, where the Nazis, but most of the time, Nazis are portrayed as uh, automatons, they're robots, they're killing robots. They, you know, they rouse, schnell, they shoot, they're sadists, they're uh, killing machines. Uh, thoughtless, um, absolutely devoid of feeling or emotion or anything like that, except anger and uh, sadism. But they weren't. And this is something that it, it, by portraying them that way, what we're doing is in a weird way, we're excusing their behavior. We're, we're normalizing it by saying, well, you know, it's a scorpion, it stings. You know, it's a, it's a killing robot. What do you expect it to do? It's told to kill, it kills, you know? That, that excuses because it was humans making human decisions in that time to do what they did. It was people who lived, uh, officers that worked at Auschwitz, who lived on the outskirts of the camp. They had, they had these cottages, these houses for them and their families, who would come in from Berlin or wherever, from Munich, wherever they lived. They would bring their wives and children and and uh, and pets, <laughs> and they and they would live in this in this uh, in this house. And I could just imagine this officer waking up in the morning, brushing his teeth, washing his face, putting on that Hugo Boss uniform, and the wife coming up to him with the door, having breakfast, coming up to him uh, at the door of that cottage and brushing the the, the dust off his shoulder. And saying, when are you going to be home for dinner, honey? 
And he says, well, we have a big train coming in today. I'm sorry, but, uh, you know, we have the Hungarians today, the fourth train in a week, you know, and, and, <laughs> and he would, after that, he would kiss their children goodbye and go do what he does, do the selection on the, on the you know, on the, tra the train side by the tracks. Uh, so it was real people doing it. It was people like us. And that's what makes it more horrific. And that's what makes people who are, who love, who are jealous, who have children, who have ambitions, who have uh, fears even, who have emotions doing that. That is, I think, I think making, saying that, showing that is much more of a statement than, than, um, than just showing shadowy Nazis, you know, doing their thing. You know, that's like, that's like orcs, you know, in, in Tolkien, if you want to talk about Tolkien, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, you've, you've actually, thank, thank you for, for saying this. I actually had a note uh, that I prepared uh, about Klaus, the uh, Nazi officer, that uh, he actually seems to become somewhat sympathetic as the story goes on. Absolutely. Especially Absolutely. near the end where he almost, you know, strokes his, his servant's head there. Um, but he's clearly a fascist, a, a, a cruel Nazi, and you know he's an asshole. <laughs> and, uh, and clearly a sadist, and clearly that. Yeah. But but you know it's. Uh, go ahead. Um, but but just that it's an interesting development, as you say, to to humanize him somewhat, so that we begin to realize that the cruelty isn't just you know. It isn't built in. It's just what it, what is you know. If there are no rules and you're allowed to mistreat people in any way you want, then this is what happens. And and this is and, and it even happened, uh, you know. But from Jew to Jew, but it's, you know, the capos who perhaps had no choice. But then I don't know. Is that really true? Do is there? Everybody really has a choice. There? Everybody always had a choice. That's that's the thing. There's no such thing as no choice. There's no, the only no choice is to survive. Yeah. That's the no choice part. But even then you had a choice. You had a choice to go and run at the electric barbed wire, you know? So, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you look at things like, I don't know, maybe for, for the more studied of you, or, uh, you know, look at things like the Stanford experiment, right. look at things like the Milgram experiment. You look at, you look at, all those things that have really shown um, Anglo-Saxon, white, middle class, quite privileged uh, college kids becoming a Nazi like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally in one, one very cleverly uh, posed uh, uh, manipulation, you know, and, and uh, you know, so what do you think would happen to a country that was uh, starving after the First World War, uh, absolutely demeaned by the rest of the world, uh, absolutely uh, without any hope and, and, and lost all their pride and so on? What do you think if a guy comes and says, hey, I'm going to make you human again, they'll do whatever the hell you tell them. And, and the same thing happened in Russia. <laughs> It really, it really is. It's exactly the same thing that just that's going on right now, uh, almost to the historical, you know, like a like a template, almost. And yeah, and so so it it could happen to anyone. It could happen to Jews. This is the crazy thing. It could happen to us that that we're victim, you know, in history. Our whole history, we were victimized, and yet. We could very quickly turn that around, you know, and and so it's this is what I wanted to do. This is what I wanted to say. By by no means condoning or or excusing the behavior of the Nazis, but to show them as human makes them more horrific to me. We condemn them more. Um, I just re was reminded as you were talking that uh, Marlon Brando did a uh, sympathetic Nazi in the movie Young Lions. Which oh. I saw when I was quite young. I think it's from the 1950s. Might be. It's uh, Irwin Shaw, right? I wrote, don't wrote the novel. Mm -hmm. I was pretty young when I saw the movie, and I just I still Irwin remember Shaw. how yeah. strong his performance was. Very sympathetic, 
uh, I think he gets killed, but you know, and and uh, he's not a hero or anything, but um, yeah, uh, I, I, you know, there again, a brilliant actor who somehow manages to make the you know the villain be sympathetic. It's it's an interesting. Uh, it's not the villain. Because... It's not about a villain. It's the ultra ultra villain. You know, it's it's the making a villain seem sympathetic has been done a million times in in uh, in the arts. Uh, but the ultra villain, the one who has never been made uh, sympathetic. No, it, no, I don't think ever. I don't think ever. It's like making a film about Stalin and making him like, kind of cool. It's, it's um, no, it's, 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 it's even been tried with Hitler. Uh, I, I recently, in, uh, Aftermath. Yeah. yeah. Aftermath. I don't think he was sympathetic in Aftermath. I really don't. Uh, he, it, this is why he was uh, hysterical. You know, and then uh, with his hand, remember that thing, if you saw the film, Last Days of Hitler in the Bunker, yeah. played by Bruno Gans. Uh, that's, that's the best. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, the best. He did a really good job, but yeah. it, I don't think it was sympathetic. No, nobody ever felt it. Maybe they felt a little bit for Goebbels' kids, maybe. But that's about it. That's about it. And the dog, of course. Yeah, dog. yeah. I guess not that <laughs> Hitler himself was sympathetic, but uh, humanizes him somewhat. I mean, we just we see the the person, not just the monster. Yeah, but still, he's insane. Yeah. They're showing him as insane, but he, uh, you know, he wasn't that one dimensional. And, yeah. and and the power that that he had over everyone around him. Uh, was that the movie where uh, after they all know he's dead, all the soldiers outside light up cigarettes because- Yeah, they, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I need okay, well, should we have more questions? Well, uh, I actually I have a couple have come in. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is kind of technical. Uh, the shot of the naked bodies from above, how did you create that? Uh, we found the skinniest people in Bobrusk. Uh, they were like these 17 year old kids you know, uh, who are probably in, now in the army and, uh, and uh, piled them into a cart. And I shot it from a drone, you know, very, very, very capable drone operator. Uh, did this rise up and turn towards the, the smokestack with the black smoke coming out of it. Oh, it was a very, very powerful print. image. Very it's powerful. the only, it, you know, it's the only like you know kind of a stock shot of the holocaust really you know that that well the the quarry i guess all that work but it's still that we've seen that before but that that was and i and i purposefully did it i have close shots of the of the cart that i shot just in case i decided not to use them just to, to be kind of detached from it a little bit well it, it was very powerful because at first you know, I, I wasn't even sure what i was seeing and 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 then i think you pulled even further up further back and mm -hmm. it became quite obvious it's it's these when you saw the smokestack yeah yeah yeah, when yeah you saw the smokestack yeah, yeah. um so a, another um uh, well i don't know if this is really technical can you tell us a little bit about the backgrounds of the actors the principal uh, yeah of course lars uh, who played klaus Koch, uh, lars is probably the preeminent german actor he is he is i think european actor Perhaps in the world, he is. Uh, he plays Hamlet in uh, Shogun, mm. which is their theater in the main theater in Berlin. Uh, it's impossible to get a ticket to Shogun. Uh, I managed to get in because I know him, but uh, it's it's one of those like it's one of those once in a lifetime you have to see. It's like watching Baryshnikov dance. It's like uh, watching Lars play Hamlet or Richard III or something like that. He's a crazy, insane, uh, androgynous uh, in real life. He wears dresses. He is, you know, he's, he's an incredible, incredible, incredible actor. If you want Lars Eidinger, I think, I think it's Eidinger is his... Uh, he has a great Instagram too. If you want, if you want to follow him, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, uh, Noel, which was a harder find, Lars was was a you know a, a slam dunk, one hundred percent. If we could get him, and I knew he could play it. Never played a Nazi either. He said to me, "You saw the Nazi in me. Thank you." <laughs> uh, 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 but Noel is, as I said, doesn't speak German. He's from Argentina. 
uh, not Jewish. Uh, he's from Argentina, and so he's a Spanish native speaker, and uh, he lives in Paris, and, you know, is an actor in Paris, and um, he's very gay, not that it matters, <laughs> but he, was, he wanted their background, so I'm giving you their background. Uh, he is um, a lovely, lovely, super talented actor, too. Yeah, which I think. Has he done any other features that? We yeah, have? yeah. He's he's done. He's he did a film called 120 BPM, which was um, quite successful at Cannes, kind of an AIDS movie. Is another Marvelous. another fun topic. He's <laughs> very um, very expressive and uh, yeah, very Jewish and uh, very uh, contained actor. Uh, it was a fantastic performance, totally believable. I thought so too. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. really, really great. Yeah. And that's all them. You know, it's not my directing magic. I don't. I don't. I usually I don't direct actors. I just choose the right actors for the role. I don't, I'm not a, one of these. Let's try. Let's do. You know, I don't do that. Um, can you talk a little bit about? Um, uh, the uh, making of the film uh, in terms of, let's say, your relationship with your director of photography and a little bit about the pre-production of the film and how long that's it took just, to that's shoot. That's boring stuff, stuff Sam. That's <laughs> boring. Someone how long has it took to who, Oh, they have? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought it was... Uh, okay. No, in that case... Not so boring. Uh, not so boring, <laughs> exactly. Um, it was uh, the shoot. Uh, the shooting period was thirty-eight days, I believe. Thirty-eight shoot days. Um, you know, a lot of prep, a lot of location work, a lot of stuff like that. My uh, director of photography was a is a friend. He's probably the best one in Russia, and I'm so sad I can't get him out of there now. Uh, I'm not even sure what's going on, but I'm certainly not going back. And uh, and. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, uh, it's a shame because I have a film coming up perhaps soon in the Baltics uh, that uh, that I want him for, but he he won't. He's not going to get a visa, that's for sure. Not to Latvia, uh, and uh, so uh, he's an incredibly talented guy. The uh, I was particularly I couldn't help but notice how how wonderful the interiors were. Uh, the uh, common the, earth, the earth tones, yeah, the yeah. earth tones. Just yeah. the, the, you know, just the, the carefully uh, placed lighting, which brings out the depth of the scene and everything in every single yeah. case. It was just yeah. really marvelous. Even in the kitchen, which is that probably a hard place to shoot. Um, all, that, all that is, a lot of that has to do with. Uh, I think I, I fired two uh, production designers on that. Hmm. Very tough on them. Yeah, we just didn't get lucky with production designers. So, so in the end, there ended up being no production designers whatsoever on this film, even though they're listed, the guys that have contributed something. Um, there was absolutely no production. So we had our prop guy, who was this brilliant guy. He's the guy that made the kitchen. You know? mm. He's the guy that brought all the tables and all the pots and all the sacks and all the pans and all the steam. You know, so, so, so it's, it was, the kitchen was an easy thing to make look great. Uh, and the authenticity, again, super, super authentic. There's nothing, usually you get these letters like you wouldn't believe it. And so many people have seen this film all over the world. And usually, oh, this lighter, they never had that until 1948. Or, you know, there's always, there's always people that know this kind of stuff. Uh, we haven't had anything except a poorly printed uh, Farsi book, which goes to Karen's um, uh, question. Uh, it's... Uh, it was uh, uh, misprinted. It, it wasn't myths of whatever. It's just, it's just some idiot. Ugh, makes me so crazy. Because I couldn't check it. You know, it's in Farsi. I don't know Farsi. Oh, I have another question here about a, a, a small detail. Uh, who was the man in the forest when Reza escaped the first time? That was a French gendarme, uh, since he spoke French. And the 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 events took place in in France. Uh, that was a French gendarme, drunk French gendarme. 
was, you know, wandering around the forest, guarding something. Uh, originally, he was catching rabbits. He was trapping rabbits, and he had a rabbit with him. I had a whole rabbit scene. Poor so, rabbit. so he's just meant to be this random guy who was also hiding out in the it's forest. Not random. I mean, he is. He's a guy that knows the 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 lay of the land, and and he's not hiding. He, they were collaborators, so the, he wasn't he wasn't hiding. He was uh, kind of like they used him as a police force. Kind of. Okay. It was a gendarme. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question. Were there uh, any Jewish actors who portrayed Nazis? And if so, how did they feel about it? There weren't Jewish actors that portrayed Nazis, I don't think. There weren't any Jewish actors at all, except the people in the truck. The people in the truck at the beginning were the remaining Jews of Bobrusk. Uh, this was. They were the, it was like the full families, the whole like uh, grandma, grandpa, the son who plays the violin. It was actually his violin. And, you know, all this and these people I, I owe the greatest uh, debt to. I mean, for them to be jumping down from that truck it was about a meter and a half height. This grandma jumping down from the truck, then falling 10 takes, falling down face first into the ravine. And making it making it seem so frigging uh, realistic and so great, and not a single one blinks as they're laying there the whole time. The camera is moving. They could have spoiled the whole shot from the very beginning. If you notice, there was one shot from the truck pulling up to revealing the dead bodies. It was a single shot. It was one movement of the camera, closer and closer and closer mm -hmm. until we saw the bodies. And and uh, which was a decision by me to do it that way. Ten takes, and they had to jump and do all this. And these poor people, I, you know, somehow they didn't get out like I did, <laughs> you know, from that world. And uh, so so you know, I made sure to make sure they're taken care of. And and uh, uh, as far as the playing Nazis, the Germans had a lot of trouble playing the Nazis. Uh, you know, the guy who played Max, uh, the, the other guy who played Paul, uh, the women especially, uh, the woman who played uh, Elsa, uh, she is, you know, I think she's a lesbian, liberal, whatever, Berlin, you know, so she's about as anti-Nazi as you can get, and, and she is... Uh, uh, and here she had to go Heil Hitler. And to them, it's, I guess that's what you were talking about, Sam Post memory. You know, to them, it's, it's, it's I can do Heil Hitler. You know, they can't, they, they can't, they can't raise their arm to do that, the Germans. They've been so frigging since babies and their, their parents so, you know, educated about it and so incredibly inured from it that uh, they, it, to them it's, 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 a, it's an unspoken thing. You know, they can't, they can't do it. So that, that took a lot to get her to, to go Zeke Heil, you know, which was interesting, the Germans. Yeah. Mm. I, I want to say that your casting of all the, the prisoners, uh, you know, in, in the barracks was also very believable. I've often seen films where none of them look Jewish. It, it no. especially happens in Italian films. None of them are skinny and yeah, they're all, yeah, yeah. Italian movies, you said, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, from other nationalities and, and it's quite obvious that- uh, And it takes you out, like, takes you out of the film. You yeah. know, yeah, I've seen uh, some that were produced in Yugoslavia and other places and it's just obvious that these people- It's just laziness. Movies. It's just laziness and poor director. That's what it is. No, I, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll speak freely of that. It's just, you know, to me, it's, you know, I, I battled. That was actually very difficult to get the right. I said, all these people are, all these people should be guards, not prisoners. You know, the ones that my uh, extras casting person put in front of me. You know, so, they, uh, all, they all look asked, like Nazis. Mm -hmm. Janet has asked, uh, were most of the actors then from Belarus? Yeah, they were yeah. Local. All of the extras, um, uh, the Germans. Here, here is the foreign actors: it was Gilles, uh, uh, Gilles, Klaus, uh, the guy who played um, uh, the commandant, the two women, uh, Max, 
Paul. Uh, Marco came from Italy, Italian actor, French actor in the forest. Uh, and the couple was from Germany. And the, 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 the colonel, the American colonel at the end was from Germany too. It was an American living in Germany. And that's it. The rest were all Belarus. So Even the, the ones, the ones who played the Nazi officers and, and obviously the guards, the, the dog handlers and all that. Too. So was anyone in the film Jewish? I mean, any of the actors, I mean. Uh, not the main ones, no. no. Oh, fascinating. No, it was enough that I was. Very, very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it, 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 it's a marvelous collaboration, and obviously, as as you can see, it's uh, this film is popular around the world. People are really, yeah, understanding yeah. it and taking to it, and and uh, I wish I could show you the the the, the, the statuettes and the, the plaques and the, it's, and yeah. you know Mazel Tov and and Kola Kavod and uh, uh, you know uh, congratulations to you in whatever language that uh, it's been uh, so well received and and i think 50 well, countries well 50 deserved countries. absolutely yeah. well deserved and i hope it has uh, as they say legs you know that it goes on for a while it will um, yeah it will my, uh, my first one did you know has still gets played uh, and uh, i think this one will too because it's, you know it's i don't know it's important and, you know having having that final scene i think is what makes this movie special it really does. It's not so much the, the authenticity and all that stuff I'm talking about, or even the main premise of surviving via a language and so on. That's all clever, interesting stuff. If that final scene, if we didn't tie it to the real names, if he didn't, by his uh, act of survival, by his act of selfish and self-flagellating uh, uh, survival, if you didn't do that, if you didn't, if you didn't inadvertently build a monument to 3,280 people, you know, that would have been all for naught. It would have been just a clever story of a Jew surviving, you know, kind of, hey, isn't, isn't, isn't he Yiddish Kopf, you know, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he smart, you know, uh, and, it, but in this case, it's, it becomes, it, it transcends, you know, and it becomes uh, that he's a real hero. It's what, extremely what moving, and, and you see that all the people sitting in that room, they begin to turn and notice that he's reciting these names, and it, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just felt yeah. it, too. It, 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 I stole that moment from Beautiful Mind, I think, oh. from the movie called Beautiful Mind, when everybody starts yeah. <laughs> suddenly clapping. <laughs> that was, I don't know, you know every, everything's borrowed, yeah. You think mm -hmm. there has to be a certain level of autism or something in someone's head, is to be able to do that. I mean, that's a remarkable feat of memory. And uh, well, not, not if you have mnemonics, which he did, you know, okay. a mnemonic, you know, where, where you use the name, part of the name as yeah. a reminder. I have trouble remembering names. So, you know, I, I I'd have trouble remembering 10 names, never <laughs> exactly. 2,800. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. It is, yeah, and I think that is, you're right. That's, that's uh, one of those images that will resonate in people's minds for perhaps years to come it will be one of those things that we remember um from from this film uh, so i have a, qu a last question perhaps um can you talk to us about your next project well you know there's a few i'm always looking uh i actually just turned down uh there's a book probably that you've all read since you're you like the topic it's called the the tattooist of auschwitz yes yeah uh, was offered to me by the Brits uh, to do a TV series, six-part series of Auschwitz. I didn't like the script, turned it down. Um, so Holocaust theme is still open for me. You know, I, I, it's important for me, I think, to keep going with it. No, no problem with that. Um, a lot of projects. I mean, it's, it's impossible to say. It really is. I can't, you know, I can't, uh, first of all, I don't want to jinx it. Second of all, you know, I can't really um, talk about, uh, it's like, you know, for, it's like spinning plates in the circus on those sticks where you run around and you spin each one and 
and as soon as one goes starts wobbling you run over and spin it again and you know you, from one of those plates i will eat yeah. well there's this famous line about hollywood producers <laughs> saying you know, uh, are you working now and and yeah, the answer works. is well i have numerous projects in various stages of development yeah, my answer is usually go F yourself, but <laughs> when they ask me that question, it's like, it's like asking a writer, so how is the writing going? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, can I, can I read a couple of pages? Yeah, of exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, th thank you so much, Vadim. Uh, I, thank I you. hope uh, that we will be able to bring you to Edmonton at some point. Uh, there, there is something uh, just for our audience. There is something in the background in the works perhaps uh, uh, that we'll see uh, because of your connection with the city and uh, we uh, love to come you, i know you have friends here and, and i think ina, yeah. ina has a question ina has yeah a question. can i butt in uh yeah i just want to thank you so much as i know you personally before you was born <laughs> i love you so much i'm so proud of you and uh, you. maybe, you know, me and Sam, we're kind of doing some volunteering work together. So maybe one day we can offer you to come in and do some uh, good, uh, you know, relationship with you. I would love that. I'd and love I to love see you. you. I love you so much. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to jump into Susan Schiffman from the film festival. I just want to thank you, Vadim. That was wonderful, Sam. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Great you, Sam. discussion. Thank you, Sam. I, Great question. I just want to I want to say one one more thing about my favorite part of the film, and that is how you managed to make us laugh at the end when when the when the uh, officer tries to get in to speak Persian. Yeah, it's just yeah. it's just so unusual to laugh after such a dark story. And it, it was just brilliant the way the yeah, way that was laughed. also kind of kind of inspired. I wrote that scene. It was inspired by a Russian novel. Uh, called the golden calf when you know he's uh, the ending of that when he's caught on the river by romanian border guards <laughs> with uh, anyway it's a great great novel well it's, okay. it's an inspired uh, you know end for that guy to Klaus, to, you know, be just perfect. Yeah, that way and it's yeah. Showing up to be what a jerk. Yeah, and, uh, actually, there was another ending which I, I hated, despised, and I fought the producers, and and uh, you know, it was um, where they all meet afterwards, Ooh. which was not the right thing to do. I didn't think. Yeah, no, no, well, no it was you, perfect. You, you ended it the right way, which uh, thank you thank very you. much for that. Thanks.